So this is a different, a slightly different slide format than you're probably uh, used to. So if you're gonna try to take a lot of notes, you're gonna get lost really fast because like one slide every couple seconds. So the title of this talk is called The House of Cards. Uh, it comes from the angle that many organizations, and I've worked some of these in the past, have a very difficult time in the real world of information security. Uh, in my in a past life, I happened to uh, work for uh, an organization that had the world's greatest preparedness plan, the world's most amazing technology implemented, and when something bad happened, nobody knew what to do next. So the, the talk here is basically on that premise, um, and if you ever get to meet uh, the chief chaos officer that inspired this, uh, you'll have to say thanks for him. So let me, I want to start with a question real quick. Uh, and just a quick show of hands, see how many people are awake. Is the enterprise you work for feel secure? Anybody who thinks that feels secure, raise your hands. All right, that's, a, that's a better than zero. So I think a lot of us have, and as I mentioned before, a lot of us have policies. Uh, a lot of us have a lot of really good paper. We have a lot of really good procedures that are out there. Uh, everybody supposed to know what they're going to be doing. Uh, all the good soldiers have a battle plan. We have a lot of controls in place. So whether they're, I'll use the dirty C word, compliance. So whether they're compliance controls, whether they're actual rational controls for other things, there's a lot of controls that are in place to keep people from doing bad things and keep bad things from happening. And most everybody has a whole lot of security technology embedded in their enterprise. So having a lot of that already in house, it's not uncommon to feel prepared, right? To say that, hey, we've got our network covered, we've got our apps covered, we've got an SDLC. Uh, plan says that if anything goes wrong, we do this, this, and this. But I want to ask it, how really prepared are you? Right. And those of you that have seen me talk before know that I like to do Python quotes. So there's a I thought I'd throw in this morning that uh, nobody really expects to say a Spanish Inquisition, but you can be ready for it. All right, somebody got that. So the question is, what are you actually preparing for? Because that is, it's a big deal. And, and there's a couple of things, right? Are you preparing for synthetic risks? Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say synthetic risks? You know those exercises that we do, uh, the preparedness exercises recently the government's been doing? Right? Completely synthetic. There's nothing real that goes in with that. They say, oh, if this and this and this were to happen, what would we do? Well, it's all on paper. Right? It's a completely synthetic risk. Are we preparing for compliance audits? Perfectly valid question. Because that's what a lot of our security policies and procedures are based off of. Are we preparing for staged attacks? What's the other word for this? Or that. Penetration testing, anybody? Who's a pen tester here? So these are staged attacks. This is where you get to go tell the company that you want to try to break into you that between the hours of 7 p.m. and 3 a.m. they're allowed to bang on these three IP addresses, but if they find something, they have to call you immediately. But don't touch these systems over here because they're actually performing business, right? When's the last time you were able to tell that to the attackers at large on the internet? You think they respect that at all? <coughs> right? Staged attacks. So are you preparing for hackers? Uh, this is an interesting question because being prepared for hackers is not the same as being prepared for some of these synthetic attacks or being prepared for what I consider the real risks. And there's a lot of real risks out there. They're not always to do with the bad guy at the keyboard trying to cross-site script you. So the other thing, are you ready for natural disasters? These, these, are, these are part of security contingency plans, right? Natural disasters are in there. And then there's, are you ready for the real hackers? There's a quote, and I can't think of who said this now, but I heard this last couple of days uh, again, so I thought I'd repeat it. The good hackers you hear about, the great hackers you never will. Right? The, great, the really, truly epic incidents will never pop up on anybody's risk dashboard or radar because they're silent and ghost-like. It's like, you know, yeah, you, they come in, they do their thing and they disappear under cover of night and nobody ever knows about it. Are you getting prepared for real incidents? This is when th this is the real world experience here. Is anybody or any of you guys around during in IT security during SQL Slammer? You know what I'm talking about then, right? When the network is completely dead 
and all of your plans and all of your call lists and all of your apps that monitor the enterprise are on that network, most of IT security sits and stares at themselves going, all right, now what? Right, because all of our policies say log in the network and, well, what if step one is broken? So when security fails, are we actually ready for security to fail? Anybody here feel prepped and ready for security to completely and holistically fail at your company at what you do? That's a tough question to answer and I'll give you that. How about when like everything fails? Think hurricanes slamming into the coastline while you're being you know, attacked digitally, right? This is the everything failure model. Your sock just got wiped off the face of the earth. Meanwhile, your data centers, which are in the cloud, are happily being exploited and nobody's there the wiser. What do you do? What do you actually do? So people processes and not just technology fails. This is the part that really gets me because we sit and spend so much time focusing on how tech fails. We spend a whole lot of time focusing on the technical end of failure, which is you know buffer overflows and exploitation of systems. We completely forget and neglect the fact that people and processes completely fail too. And it gets really easy to feel safe. And I'm telling you guys from experience and, and that I've been there, we don't often share our failures, so it's really hard to tell each other where we failed the last time we tried something. And it's easy to feel safe. Except I would replace safe with complacent. It's easy to feel like, hey, we did everything. All of our, you know, the lights on the IPS are green. The last pen test we had against our one public IP which our address was good. We're compliant, life is great. Well, what is it that you feel safe based on, right? And the thing that I always try to convince folks to do is go get some evidence. What is the evidence that you have that says that you, that allows you to feel secure? Anybody have any really good evidence they use to make, to give themselves a good sense of security? What do you use? All right, pen test report. Anybody else? Anything? No, most people would say the lack of a documented compromise. The lack of a documented compromise. That's a very valid point. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> rows and rows of blinking lights that say the word security on them. That's beautiful. Absolutely. So the, the, <laughs> so the question is, how prepared do you still feel knowing that there are other things out there than just digital technical threats? And the answer is you're likely really, really not. Unless you've actually done some of the things that we're going to talk about in a minute. You're, you get really prepared and you can be prepared on paper. And you can be prepared with all the best intentions in the world, but when the world falls apart, when things actually go from bad to really, really, really bad, and you have absolutely no way to move forward, untested becomes unprepared. And untested is a new level of uh, kind of thinking here. We're not talking about you know, scanning a web app. We're not talking about uh, getting pen tested on that, you know, between the hours of 8 and 9 uh, p.m., right, when the system, nothing is working on your system. Or we're not talking about, and this is from a uh, discussion yesterday, had this wonderful, uh, had this wonderful thought about, you know, um, I think, Tim, I believe it, you said it the other day, where, you know, you're working with a client and they say, can you give us a couple days? We're not ready for your pen test yet. Right? Fantastic line demonstrating exactly how untested really means unprepared. And validating defenses is super critical and crucial here. Because if it's not validated, it's probably, un you know, it's probably not going to withstand the test of chaos. So validated, you need to validate the defenses, you need to validate your response to these kinds of issues, these kinds of incidents. And you need to be able to validate your technology. See, this we can do, right? We've gotten fairly decent at this. Validating technology generally is something we're, people in this room are pretty good at. We can put it in a lab, we can 
bang on it, we know what attacks it can be susceptible to, and then we can point it and say, haha, we broke it. SQL injection, haha, we broke it, buffer overflow, something else, some other kind of exploitation. But the technology is probably the easiest part. And I really think organizations need to go hack themselves. I don't mean get pen tested in a time box, very polite manner. I mean seriously go break something. Or in some cases, if you don't have the talent, go hire somebody to go do it for you. And here's the key, you ready for this? Without restrictions. This is, we need to know how prepared we are against a real world incident because we have a high risk business. So we're gonna pay somebody to go break in, steal things. There is no during the following hours or with these IP addresses or you're only allowed to fish these three executives because the rest of them clearly will fall for it. Right, fair doesn't matter. And so there's a word of caution here, um, again, as with the chief chaos officer role, if you ever get to that point, it's pretty cool. You know, getting to be able to break the organization down and find its weaknesses and break the defenses down is really cool. And it's a real great way to figure out the real metal that the company's built on, except for the fact that you can actually break something really bad. And if you break something really bad, bad things happen, like loss of job. Loss of revenue is generally also bad, but if you don't have a job to go back to on Monday, the loss of revenue for the company is probably immaterial to you. So this could be disastrous. So this is why we're going to talk a little bit about how to have structured disaster, right? It's, it's kind of an interesting concept. So I played with this a little bit because I think that random destruction tends to lead to that and bad things. Right? You don't want to ever like walk out of an organization and go, boy, they were so, we were so vulnerable with the mushroom cloud behind you. That's not constructive. Right? At the end of the day, we're not here to be secure. Organizations generally don't exist to be secure. They have an, there's another motive behind why companies exist. This is one of those things that I think the security industry really needs to get over is the world doesn't revolve around being secure. Secure is a secondary or potentially tertiary or even further down the line requirement. It's sometimes a requirement for doing business. Sometimes it's a requirement for having clients. Sometimes it's a requirement just because the news says it is. Or the SEC mandates that it is. Or some other group says it has to be, right? But I promise you if you go back to work and you say, hey, what's our business goal? Why are we all here? Your CEO won't say to be secure which means that we have to do what we, be able to test ourselves and find out our own weaknesses and our weak points constructively without blowing the heck up out of the business. So, red team go. Anybody do red team? Awesome, greatest job in the world if you've ever done it. Right? Red team basically gets to go break things actively. Now, I think we need to start looking at this in baby steps because if we just unleashed red teams on most of our organizations, really bad things would happen. Right? This is sort of like the uh, back in you know, 10 years ago when I got to do a, the first review of, a, of an, a web app where I was working. The first time we had ever done a security review of a web app before. Never did it before. This was the first app to go through. And they're like, yeah, sure, put it through the, you know, Put it through the ringer. We want to know exactly what we're vulnerable to. We want to know exactly how bad we are. Just go ahead and see what you can do. And within 10 minutes, the entire platform was dead. They're like, well, how, you know, what was wrong with the application? Like, I have no idea. It never got past the logging because I crashed the app. Right? Let's start with the fact of keeping this thing up. Let's work from that premise. Right? So baby steps are kind of required. And this is going to be a multi-step journey. This is a multi-step get there slowly Right? Slow burn kind of process. All right, so now what? How do we get there? This is the kind of the cool part. I think we need to be always thinking about, from a security perspective, red team in the back of your head. Right? If you get to do this, and you actually get to do this actively for a living, fantastic. This is, it's a great feeling. 
But a lot of organizations turn and give you that deer in the headlights look. Because what happens is, you know, you tell them, you get them convinced that, yeah, you're probably unprepared. Yes, you probably have more problems than you know how to diagnose or do anything with. But see, they go, okay, what do we do? Where do we start? We've got 1 million connected devices on the network, you know, 350,000 employees. Now what? You can't just go hack all the things. You don't have enough people. So where do you begin and how do you get out of the deer in the headlights and what we call analysis, by, uh, analysis paralysis, right? You sit there and think about and try to plan out what are you going to do, how are you going to stage it, how are you going to attack, what you're going to attack. And before you know it, the year's gone. And you haven't made a decision yet and you haven't done anything yet. So here's the plan. We're going to talk about this in basically four key phases, right? There's four phases to go hack yourself and be able to build a chief chaos officer. Anybody want to be a chief chaos officer? Wouldn't that be the coolest role ever? I know, I know at least one of them and it's ridiculous, but it's pretty cool. So the phase one of this is obviously assessment, right? And assessment really means what does life look like when bad things happen? Let's look at the on paper results. Let's pull out those you know, dusty binders, those three ring pages from hell about if A then B, this is what our security posture looks like, this is how when something happens, this is who you call, this is what system you go connect to, this is the procedure you go to gather evidentiary information. Let's look at it on paper. What are the defenses? A lot of organizations spend entirely too much time defending the wrong thing. Anybody ever run into that before? Where you spend a whole lot of time and a whole lot of capital defending applications, defending systems that are actually of really low relevance to the organization that you work for. So let's look at what are these defenses on paper. Let's look at how prepared are we on paper. Do we have the right call sheet? Do we have escalation plans? Do we have disaster preparedness? Do we have a policy that says what happens when we can't reach the CISO? And somebody has to make a decision. See, unfortunately, in a lot of organizations, if that decision maker is unreachable, everybody sits and waits. If the cell phone network is offline, you're going to be sitting for a while. Unless you're doing IPOCP, IP over carrier pigeon. Or smoke signals, right? That's not high bandwidth transaction right there. Let's think about what we could break. What is the potential? Where is the stuff that's the weakest, the most brittle? What could possibly break in our enterprise? Where are the things that we know generally have weaknesses, that we know generally have a hard time staying together, staying unbroken, right? We can look at this from across the industry. We can look at this from how, uh, you know, what are the, the news says, what our colleagues know, the kind of information we share in groups. Because, gosh, we don't do enough of that, I tell you right now. Then let's ask, how bad would it be if things really went sideways? How bad would it be? If everything failed, right? If you can do this in stages, it's really not that difficult. The paper simulation behind this is actually relatively easy. You look at the top 10 critical systems in your enterprise and go, all right, that just failed. Now what? If you've ever done this in real life, it means walking up to the exchange server that you all have or the giant exchange cluster and pulling out the IP cable or the Ethernet cables and not telling anybody what you did. See what happens, right? Because everybody instinctively goes, oh, I should find the uh, exchange admin to call. Let me grab my phone, do an address book lookup, and uh, oh, the address book doesn't work. Well, now what? Because that's the mail server. What do you do? How bad could this be? Let's look at artifacts from the past. You probably have some of this in-house. If you don't, there's a wealth of knowledge sitting right around you. How many of you guys have never been involved in a really bad incident? Never been involved. 
If you never have been involved, look at everybody that didn't raise their hand and strike up a conversation at some point. It's a great way to learn. Like, just ask, what happened and what did you learn from it? I encourage you guys to share failures as artifacts from the past. It's okay to fail. We generally, as a community, tend to bury our secrets. When things didn't go right, we'll just never talk about them, pretend it didn't happen. Unfortunately, the same thing will keep happening across to other companies, other people, if you don't talk about it. The reason I'm giving this talk is because I is in part of a failure that there was absolutely no recovery from, and, you know, it, and it was just horrible. And I very much just hope that you guys don't go through the same kind of thing. Is there any empirical evidence, indisputable proof of your preparedness? Have you actually done one of these simulations? Maybe you've done one on paper, right? The synthetic attack. That's better than nothing. If you have some kind of anything evidence that you're able to thwart attack, that you're able to stop the bad guy. Moving into stage two, we're to talk about planning. Um, planning is a little bit different than your standard pen test because planning, there's a lot more involved because of the sheer magnitude of the potential oops. We're gonna try to make sure you keep your job here. Right? I want you to be able to go through this type of exercise, walk out of it going, boy, we got a lot more knowledge and all of us are still employed. Yeah, things broke. Yeah, we caused some pain to the company, but we're all still employed. This is a good thing. So in the planning stage, let's talk about what's in scope. Your vendors. Do you trust software, hardware, services that you get from your vendors? What if one of them was in your data center right now being paid by a foreign organization to install Trojan firmware on your, I don't know, routers or something? Then what? Would you be prepared to shut down vendor connections? Right? If there's an attack coming from a vendor and you know it, identify it. Are you in a position where you can simply say, you know what, I'm just going to cut that right off? In most organizations, the answer is no, because we do business that way. What else is in scope? Our partners. If you work for a large organization, you probably have about a thousand consultants from random companies sitting at your desks that do not work for you. These are your partners in crime. What else is in scope? How about yourself? Think about what would happen if those of you guys, who has access to admin permissions or godlike permissions on your systems, networks, not at home, right? On your networks? What would happen if you found out in about two weeks that while you were at a conference, somebody trojaned your laptop has been slowly siphoning off information from your corporate database? Then what? Because nobody wants to walk into that office and go, hey, um, that, sort of, that data breach source, yeah, that was me. So bad people don't discriminate. This is the one point I wanna make to you guys. When we're thinking about how we're gonna go through and plan this and test ourselves, we need to think about being slightly discriminating against what we're gonna break, how, because the company needs to continue. The, quote, bad guys don't care. Right? This is not like bad guys that come at you and bad people that come at you. Don't scope your attacks through a pen test sta statement of work. They don't time box. They don't say, well, that guy's a CEO, so I clearly can't fish from using his email account because everybody will fall for it. That's the first thing they're gonna do. Right? So the bad people don't really care, right? <sighs> Unfortunately, much like other types of engagement, the good guys have to follow the rules. Again, business needs to continue. This is our primary purpose where we work. And keep reminding ourselves of that. So the, while the good guys follow the rules, the bad guys simply don't, they don't care. They'll break something. If they break something, they don't care, they'll move on. They don't work there. 
This can actually turn into a state of very, very big overwhelming feelings. Because you think about, well, all right, I want to go test and figure out how prepared I am. I know I have to be semi-realistic about it. I know I have to think about how the other side is, how the attackers are actually going to come at me. I know I need to think about the social aspect, the digital aspect, the physical aspect. I need to think about somebody driving a, a pickup truck through the plate glass front door window of the company and just walking in and taking those servers out. Because it's happened before, right? It's not unheard of, it's not uncommon. So it's overwhelming, but we can strategize this in pieces. We can think about this in small pieces and in small parts. Right? I like small parts better because when small fails, it's easier to put the rug over it than when big things fail. So I would probably say let's start with a small, solitary application because everybody's the world centers around apps today. Right? It's a 75-25. 75% of our budgets go to infrastructure security while 25% go to the applications and the rest. Meanwhile, 75% of the attacks come from the applications and 25% from the infrastructure. I don't know about you, but I'm uncomfortable with that statistic. So look at a single solitary standalone app that if you test and break, eh, maybe the uh, corporate cafeteria system stops working for a day. Oh well, right? Start working, then work outwards towards the bigger units. Don't decide that tomorrow or on Monday after doing a little bit of planning, you're now going to go after the entire company, corporate secrets, social, physical, digital attacks and all. It'll probably end in tragedy. You can do move into entire business units. So start with a small app, go to something bigger, then move into business units. Many of you guys work in companies where the organizations that you work for have a corporate entity and many silos underneath it. Right? Start with the smallest revenue generating business unit. The one that where if you break something and they can't make money for, I don't know, a week, you don't cause a Wall Street panic on your stock. And eventually you do need to go all in. Right? This is kind of like the, the poker game that gets to a point where you know what at some point you're gonna just have to be all in and so what I'm telling you is as you work your way up this stack of attacks as you work your way up this stack of corporate assets you're gonna start learning stuff from it because eventually everything becomes in scope in real life everything is in scope everything you touch Everything the organization is responsible for, your customers, your data, your business processes, your people, all of it's in scope. And you need to start thinking just like a real attacker, not like a time box pen tester. A real attacker, meaning screw the rules in small bite-sized chunks. So. One point that I do want to make, and this is something that I'll emphasize um, only because first time around doing this, uh, did have a problem with it. So who do you tell? All right, you're going to go, as part of the security red team, you're going to go after this one corporate app, small, hopefully nobody notices, but you're actually going to go hack it, not simulate. You're actually going to go break the app down. You're going to go steal the database because you know it's SQL injective. You're going to go steal the database and then send an email to the CISO from an anonymous Gmail account that says, I've stolen your database. I want $500,000 not to release it. Who do you tell first so that you don't end up in jail? You can't tell everybody because then we're back to, hold on, we're not prepared for the pen test yet. You can't tell nobody because then you get a really nice pair of silver bracelets. And get to meet people you probably don't want to as your bunkmates. So who do you tell? Remember, let's be realistic here. Anybody, any thoughts on who we tell? Who would you tell? Legal. 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 I like that. Everybody says legal. Fantastic. 
you have a chief legal counsel, this would be a great person to sit in with. Like, all right, here's the plan. Here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to save us the pain and heartache of when things go horribly wrong, but I don't want to be in jail after this. So I need you to draft this document up that says I've got free reign, but I'm going to be responsible, but I'm going to do everything I can to be responsible, everything I can to document, everything I can to con allow business continuity, but I'm going to be nasty. I mean, that's my goal. And the idea, let's tell as few people as possible, because the less anybody has a chance to prepare for your test or for your evaluation of security, the better. Right? Preparedness it should be something we have on Sunday at 2 a.m. and Monday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Also, while everybody in the company is at the company picnic, not just when we're ready for it. But don't forget. Everybody knows what that stands for. Cover your assets. All right. Make sure you know somebody with authority in the organization. Chief legal counsel is a great person because nobody ever argues with the lawyer. Of course, Tiffany's gone. Um, but nobody ever really has, you know, the legal folks really kind of know what your, where the boundaries are and how far you can push before you, you kind of break. Some trusted senior leadership is probably a good idea. You want to gain trust within senior leadership at a, at a large company? Tell them you're doing this and tell them you're trusting them with not telling anybody else because this is that critical. See what happens. All right. Let's take some action because action is good. I like action. All right. Lots of talk, no action. Makes Billy a dull boy. So I say ready the ninjas because at some point we're going to have to find a way to go out and break all the things. To borrow a friend's quote. You're going to have to have a team of really, really cool, really, really smart, really, really stealthy individuals. Unless that's just you. That's perfectly valid too. If you're a ninja, power to you. But if your idea of testing is Nessus and a scanner, you're probably not a ninja. So let's talk about validation in phases, right? We said about how we're going to plan this in phases. Let's make sure we can validate what we know. Validate the bad things that could potentially happen in phases. We're going to start with doing some recon. Stake out the place. Physically, virtually, figure out where the easiest point of attack is, what time everybody goes to bed, if at 5 p.m. on Friday the entire security team, including the guys that man and gals that manage the sock, are sitting at the bar down the street. You laugh, but it happens way too often. Because, gosh, at 5 p.m., nobody's really going to attack our systems because we need a break. You know, I, I mentioned SQL Slammer earlier, and there's nothing quite like the feeling of, oh crap, that comes in when at 7 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, you're out, in, you know, you're out camping with your family and a bunch of your friends, and you know, camping often involves hijinks. You're 100 miles from the office and all of your pagers go off at the same time, and it says all hands. You're like, cool, I'll just VPN in. Huh, VPN's not working. What's email say? Hmm, email seems to be down. This is not good. Then what? Right? Bad things don't wait for you to be prepared. So recon is really cool because we need to know where the attack, where the attack surface is weakest, where to attack most. If you're a pen tester, this is stuff you should already know. Target acquisition is important. Because if you ever did a target acquisition map where you map out all the assets that you're going to potentially attack, things that you've discovered, an app over here, an API over here, a system over here, an IP over here, a person over here, a security guard that's asleep at his desk over here, right? the big dumpster in the back where all the corporate secret documents go over there, you can 
relatively easily assign numerical values and risk scores to things that where the easiest stuff to attack is. And the key here is where is the least likelihood of being caught? Because the whole goal is here, we don't want to be caught. Let's find a target that's right for picking. We want high value, we want low risk. Blending in is usually a good thing. Right? If we can get a lot of value, a lot of good insight, a lot of good data out of an attack, out of a particular asset, and there's a low risk that wouldn't get caught, fantastic. Next step behind this, obviously, that's infiltrate. Digitally or physically. It's really hard to walk into your own company and not be noticed unless you work at a Fortune 100, right? In which case, you could probably do it all day long. But this is where hiring some ninjas may be a good idea because you can get in and if your assets are physical that you're going after CEO's laptop, for example, because that's where the quarterly budget is on or the uh, quarterly earnings report that you're going after. If you, that's what you want, that's your target, that's the recon has told you that that's the best target at the stage that you're at, might be a good idea to find somebody that has a cleaning crew outfit. It also might be a good idea to figure out when, based on the attack patterns you see on all those pretty reports you get at the end of the week, when the attack level is the highest on your external defenses, because that is the one time that your, prob your team is probably least looking at right, to get hacked. Because that's when a lot of that, that signal to noise ratio goes up real high. Pen testing 101, establish a beachhead. Whether you're fishing and dropping a, a payload onto a workstation, whether you're hacking and you get a shell, root shell on an external box, whether you're walking into the CEO's office after he or she has gone out to lunch and installing a keylogger, whether you're sending out an email saying, hey, this is the latest corporate mobile app you need to install on your droid, please go do this as soon as possible and they install it. Whatever it is, establishing a beachhead and doing further reconnaissance, right? What's next? Pen testing teaches us, if you've ever done this, find what your attack, surf attack is, make the attack, probe deeper. Until you, there's nothing else to find. Until you've broken all the things and found all the things and taken all the things. Reevaluating our targets because target posture changes. Anybody ever been on a pen test or doing an assessment where the, the you know what I'm talking about, the target posture, posture changing? Where a system is vulnerable, you attack it, you get a beachhead on it, you start poking around and you realize that box that you were just on, somebody caught it, patched it, and is now watching you. Right? Constantly reevaluate where your jump points are, where your entry points are, so that you're not being watched, so that you're not being monitored. And get to, you can give yourself away that way, way too easily. And of course, the ultimate goal here is exfiltration. Take all the things and run like hell. Now, given the uh, context in which we're talking here, you're not just gonna wanna Take the safe, leave a big bomb in its place, and take off, right? You don't want to leave the, the things that you've stolen from in smoldering rubble. That's probably a bad thing. It's not good for the career, I promise. But you do want to take everything, all right? Take as much as you can to prove that you can, and then absolutely leave zero trace behind, if you can. But oftentimes, we don't care whether we leave a trace or not. Because I've stolen stuff. I don't care whether you can find my throwaway shell on a server in China. Go for it. I just blame the Chinese. Don't get caught. It's kind of a good rule of pen testing, right? When stealing, don't get caught. Bad things happen when you get caught. The one thing that you probably don't think about is keeping really, 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 really good notes for two reasons. One, Remember that talk we had with that lawyer? 
keep fantastic notes of what you did because somebody's gonna say, well, while you were doing this, you broke this thing over here. And you're like, yeah, I was actually never on that thing over there. All my notes and everything I've done is confined to this space over here. So you can't blame me for that catastrophic failure. That's all you. The other reason to keep good notes is so you can then learn from them. Right? The whole point of this exercise is figuring out how I can break something. And then you get to go back in with the masonry and patch up the holes. This is a really hard part. Because I'm going to tell you right now, what we've done up to now is the fun part. It's the easy part. It's not hard to break stuff. You guys agree? Most organizations you're asked to go break stuff in, it's really not that hard. They're like a giant M&M, &M, right? Soft or hard, crunchy outside, once you get past that, it's a soft, gooey middle. Oh no, you've reached the firewall. What will we do? Is anybody else sick of hearing the, uh, the castle and the outer wall and breaching defenses and all that analogy yet? I am. That was never really valid in the first place. So, now we're going to go through and do some analysis. This is the hard part. This is where you actually earn your key because you've broken stuff, you've made out with all the information, you've got that quarterly earnings report two weeks before anybody sees it, and you go, all right, fantastic. So, I want to make a prediction. You broke stuff. This is just a general prediction. Every, when you do this the first time, remember this. You will have broken something. It will be completely unintentional. And you would have caused some people some pain. I promise. Things will have broken. So the question is, what broke? This is, I'm not talking about hacking things. Like things breaking. By you going through and attacking systems trying to acquire data and exfiltrate it, odds are somewhere along the line you caused a breakage, right? You had to stop a cron job somewhere in order to get access to a system, or you had to reboot something, or you had to do an insert into a database table and overwrote something by accident, and all of a sudden a bunch of transactions are failing, whatever. But something broke. So part one of this analysis stage is what actually broke, not related to me breaking in, but what broke during the course of my break in and why. So that's one part of a really good value that you get out of this. Because we'll count this as, as a system resiliency failure. See, resiliency is something we don't often talk about in security. You guys know what the Underwriters Labs does? You ever seen the UL seal on a, on a fireproof safe? Anyone? What, is the, what does that mean? What is fire? So how are, are, if you look at a fireproof safe and you're buying a fireproof safe, are they all just fireproof? They're rated to what? Heat and time. How hot can you get and for how long? That's what you pay for, right? The longer and the high, the longer it can stay in higher temperatures and protect the precious stuff inside, the more it's going to cost you. This is how security works in the real world. The longer you can keep a bad guy with a bigger cannon out of your good stuff, out of your precious IP, the more it's going to cost you. But if you have, during the course of your attack, a massive resiliency failure, I got news for you. You're not even, forget security, you're not even resilient. Oftentimes we figure out that systems that we thought were redundant, things that we thought failed over gracefully, first off, there's no gracefully, and second off, it didn't even fail over. You guys familiar with root cause analysis? RCA, who's done an RCA before? All right, fellow corporators. If you've done a root cause analysis, you have to actually go and start with, okay, system X broke, Y. Well, it's connected to system Y and Z, and I unfortunately only touched A over here. How the heck is A and Z connected? Root cause analysis enables you to figure out what broke, why did it break, and how do we actually fix it? All right, that's the key. Now let's start asking ourselves, did the attack succeed? Anybody want to know the answer to this? Yes, it did. <laughs> Odds are, yes, it did, right? But 
I think this is the wrong question. Because the answer is 98% of the time going to be, yes, it did. Okay. Were you able to walk through the building with a fake ID? Yes, I was. Why? Because I was wearing a, a, a hard hat and I told them there was a gas leak and everybody just got the heck out of my way. And in fact, the, the security guard opened doors for me. Cool. You know, were you able to hack that app? Yep. 30 seconds. Got the whole database. Were you able to get into the data center? Yep, absolutely. Right? If you've done pen testing, you know the answer to that question is always yes. But that is unfortunately the wrong question. It's not did you hack it. It's how successful were you? you guys with me? How successful were you? Were you able to take all the things? Or were you able just to get access to some? And could you cause a catastrophic failure? Did you cause a catastrophic failure? Now are you now sitting in the chief legal counsel's office trying to convince them not to fire you? Because attacks rarely fail. It is just a sad reality of, of life, right? A concerned, concentrated attack will rarely fail. We know this from experience. So there's three key measures here. There's three key measures, in my personal opinion here, there are three key measures of figuring out how, answering that, how successful was I? One, how long did it take me? 30 seconds or 30 days? Right, we're going back to that fireproof safe analogy, which I'm growing fond of more every day. How long did it take? And this is just like that whole UL fireproof rating. How long did I have to bang on it? How much time and resources of mine did it consume? This person that is considered a fantastic pen tester, a great reverser, took him three weeks to get into that app. You know what? I may be comfortable with that. Next measure is damage. How extensive was, was the attack? How bad did it get? How bad was it? Was I able to transfer money out of the CEO's account? Was I able to email our board of directors using the you know, CFO's uh, email account and tell them that he quit? Was I able to steal that earnings report? Was I able to what? What's, what's the, what did you do? How bad was it? And the last measure here is criticality. So sort of the one thing that we typically, typically forget when we do pen tests is, yes, I broke it in 30 seconds. Yes, it was horrible. But unfortunately, the asset nobody cared about. Right? It's completely irrelevant to the company. Yay, you broke through and stole a marketing server. Sure, the marketing team cares. But in the grand scheme of things, or how bad it is it to the company? Eh. Right? Your recon was pretty poor if that's what you were doing. So what did you get? And then we get to the hard part. Right? This is the, ana the analysis part was pretty difficult. And I've done these. These, these are not fun exercises. They usually require several whiteboards and a lot of time, and a lot of erasers, and a lot of people walking past your office and going, yeah, that's not how that actually works. And you get to erase the line and realize you got to start over. So now the hard part. You get to do a full root cause analysis on what you did, why you did it, how it broke, and what you're going to do to fix it. See, the role of the chief chaos officer isn't just cause chaos. The secret behind this is you need to be able to come back and say, by the way, this is what we do to make sure this doesn't happen next time. Right? It's okay to be a bull in a china shop. You just have to put back better china. So you have to look at the full attack path. Where did you start? Where did you end up? What did you touch along the way? Why did you make the decisions that you made? And then ask yourself, where did security fail? Right? Remember those binders we pulled out at first? Those response plans, those call sheets? Where, what part of that failed? If nobody noticed that you, went, you know, hacked a database and stole all the customer records, what part of that failed? Something failed. Maybe everything failed. But there is something at the very beginning 
Right? What was step one that never happened? Detection. If you were never detected, why? Because you were able to craft packets that got past the IPS. Great. The IPS failed. Why? Oh, it wasn't up to date. Why? Because the InfoSec team is too busy doing 37 other things. Why? Right? It's like that five-year-old. You, you get to keep asking why, 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 until there is no more why. It's just this is why it happened. That's what we call a root cause analysis. Why did security fail? And if the answer is because the knock guy was on vacation, you have a problem. Did detection fail? Did the analysis fail? Were they able to figure out that they were being attacked, but just couldn't figure out why or where it's coming from? Or were they able to detect you, figure out where you were coming from, but couldn't do anything about it? because you own their accounts. That's perfectly valid too. There have been several incidents like this that I got involved with where we were breaking into a customer through a web app. And you get into the web app and you start getting to critical systems during high usage periods when they're doing things like account transfers between them and, and the uh, payment company that they work with or something, and they can't shut that process down. So if that process takes four hours, you have free reign for four hours. Because if they shut that down, the company goes home for the day. So does the protection mechanism work? Was it a people failure? Unfortunately, the answer a lot of the time is absolutely. People fail more often than technology. Was it a process failure? Was step one on the emergency response plan not available and everybody just sort of goes, okay, now what? All right, step one, pull up your phone, get into the exchange server, call, call everybody on that call sheet. Uh, can't get to the exchange server, now what? I don't know. Seriously, like what would you do in that case? <coughs> yeah, exactly. Google. <laughs> yeah. Right? Help. If you have to get out on Twitter and DM your sock, not a good thing. That's not incident response. That's just sheer panic. Did, did technology fail you? And odds are technology can fail you as well, right? Technology fails because there's this unfortunate part behind it that's called the human that programmed it. Right? Technology will become perfect once we eliminate the human element. And by that point, I think I've seen that movie. I didn't like the way that turned out for them. Did your enterprise intelligence fail? What do I mean by enterprise intelligence? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, so things like your process tree. Enterprise intelligence to me and to us means how much knowledge do you have? Do you know what's out there? Do you under, does it help you understand what's going on and does it give you an opportunity to react in at least near real time? You can get stuff like this from your SIM. You can get stuff like this if you have a good SIM. You can get stuff like this from meetings. You can get stuff like this from real time alerting systems, real-time connectivity between people in operations centers. This is why when you've got an operations uh, company that's got an operations center for applications, one for networking and one for security, you know you can walk through that organization like a hot knife through butter because they'll never talk to each other no matter how bad things get. And that giant spike in network traffic followed by those suspicious security packets followed by that 300 uh, CPU spike, 300% CPU spike on the database, they'll never put that together. Because the database spike will eventually go away and the, network, and the uh, server ops team will go, hmm, wonder what happened. Don't have time, right? Too busy keeping servers up. This one fixed itself. On the networking side, they'll go, hey, look, traffic spike. CEO is probably surfing um, things. Downloading those quarterly reports. Um, and on the other side of that, they're like, hey, look, um, suspicious packets. How many times, honestly, do you think people in security circles investigate suspicious packets? Really? Zero. Absolutely correct. I've never seen anybody that's done that. 
Because one, they don't have time to investigate all the stuff that's flagged as critical. So again, that whole thing about being unable to completely connect the dots, big problem. Now, I'm going to go back to you and point the spotlight back at you and say, all right, smarty pants, chief chaos officer. Sure, you broke all the things. Sure, you made out with all the cool data. All right, tell me how to fix it. <laughs> no, you're fired. <laughs> Unplug it is not a valid answer. Unless you've already tendered your resignation, in which case that might be a pr pretty fun thing to say during your exit interview. <laughs> all your crap's broken. By the way, I quit. Um, no, oh, but there's got to be a remedy to this, right? Go back to Defense 101. We want to be able to deter, de detect, deter, and respond. We want to be able to have countermeasures. What happens if? We want to be able to cause minimum change in the organization. Change as few things as possible while pointing out how to make things better and fix them and have a minimal impact, both financial and physical and people-wise. We need to know what our goals are. Do we want to deter the casual hacker? Do we want to deter or slow down the attacker? Do we want to detect and react quickly? Because that's perfectly valid. Do we want to simply fortify our deficiencies? Do we want to optimize defenses? Like, what is your goal for making things better? Making things better is not a valid answer. The red team actually never rests because business always changes. Priorities change, technologies change, and gosh, the attackers always change, right? You're never gonna see that same attack twice, and if you do, it's because your neighbor didn't tell you about it. Threats will continue to evolve. It's naive to think that attackers won't move past sim the simple attacks we see today. It's naive to think that the terrorist element won't move into the cyber world or hasn't already, right? This isn't fun, this is fact. Right? It's simply naiveness that we're trying to knock off. I encourage you to go test your defenses, test your responses, and use these real-life attacks because you don't want to find out that during a catastrophe things go bad. You want to fail at your own hands and not your enemies. And thank you very much.